So now to our opening plenary. We're going to explore the issues of access to health that women face, as well as looking at the potential for women entrepreneurs in health tech to bring about solutions to those issues. This is again one of, uh, one of the key topics of the Women's Forum agenda, uh, access to health, as Kiara just mentioned. We have done a lot of research during uh, this year. We have also worked with women in health tech and supported them with funding and mentoring. Some of them have been speaking today. So a very important topic for the Women's Forum, it's really about developing the solution for women in health tech to provide e um, solutions to the issues of access to health that women face. So to lead that very important discussion, please join me in welcoming Lona Friedman, who is the health lead at Mercer, the knowledge partner for the Staring Circle, and her speakers. Um, I um, am so delighted and privileged to be here this morning. My name is Lorna Friedman. I'm a physician, and I am the global health lead for Mercer. And Mercer has um, is delighted to be a knowledge partner with the Women's Forum um, in regards to our work on women and access to health. So before I start, I just if I could get hands, how many of you are work in healthcare? Wow, pretty good. Um, and for the rest of you, welcome. Because um, yesterday I noted people said, oh, everyone's in tech. Um, and I would say everyone's in health as well. And it's a fantastic time to be in health um, because we are really at a crossroads. And we'll discuss that today. So first, you know, in September, the United Nations declared health a human right um, for the first time, there's certainly been discussion, but all nations signed on to that agreement. Additionally, the $3 billion that was spent in the 1990s by governments and academic centers to map the human genome has now really blossomed into extraordinary treatments. Um, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I'm from New York, so I'm not even used to microphones. Um, so um, we um, uh, has, you know, again, blossomed into extraordinary treatments, you know, and Edna and I think, uh, you know, when we treated babies with Vernon Kaufman's who, you know, their fate was, uh, was sadly determined, and now they will have full lives because of that treatment. And cancer treatment, long, long uh, kind of difficult cancers like lung cancer will now be cured. And yet, and yet, Women and disparities, both geographic, race, socioeconomic, have now become even wider. And so how do we use technology? How do we use the collective force of rooms like this to make sure another generation of women are not marginalized? And so with that, I will turn to this extraordinary group who have been working on that. Um, and I would ask for you all to um, introduce yourselves, introduce your organizations, and how are you working to bring technology as, um, as a uh, way in which we can really begin to address um, equity um, and disparities in health? So Guillaume. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. So I'm Guillaume Bory. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Axanex which is the, the, the unit within uh, the AXA Group, the insurance company, in charge of the development of new business models and innovation. And we have a very strong focus around health. Uh, and uh, in, this, in this focus around health, significant part of our efforts is uh, focused on improving access to healthcare, making it simpler and smarter, in particular for women. And you were mentioning the, the fundamental issue of access to women to the workforce and the very fact that today there is a, a lack of involvement of active women into the workforce. And one of the fundamental issues that we need to solve if we want to improve this access is the access to healthcare. 
Why? Because we clearly see that there are some very specific issues when it comes to women and health. I will just mention two very basic examples. In the US, we know that 80%, 80% of the health decisions in the family are made by women. So it means, concretely speaking, that on a daily basis, you have many women that are obsessed with the health decisions that they need to make. And if we don't do something to improve their access to health care, to advice, to doctors, then we are not going to kind of free some time for them and also give them the opportunity to access better to, uh, to workforce. Second uh, uh, fundamental point to keep in mind, there are some health issues that are very specific to women. Of course, access to gynecologists, but we know also the role that in many countries, the lack of education on periods is playing in the fact that very young women, kids, do not have access to proper education. And that during months and even years, they cannot go to school because they don't know what to do when the periods are coming. So those issues, there are issues that are, of course, directly impacting women. So what can we do about it? And so what we do at AXA is focusing 80% of our efforts, of our innovation efforts, around better access to health by leveraging technology. With technology, we have a unique opportunity to develop new solutions and provide this simpler, smarter access to health that I was describing in my introduction. I will just mention two examples there also. One which is a, a startup that we incubated, uh, named Apricity, which is focused on fertility management. And today, helping women, especially in the UK, on improving the access to fertility solution and managing the healthcare journey when you have a fertility issue. A fundamental problem for today, more than 25% of couples that are willing to conceive. And the second example is all of our efforts around telemedicine. And I was looking yesterday at one of our business in France named Care, and I see the CFO of Care on, on, the, on the first row here, uh, uh, Sylvie. Uh, and in Care today, 65% of the consultations on the platform are made by women. After access to JP, the, the teleconsultations are mostly done with gynecologists especially to monitor pregnancy. So it's a concrete example of how you use technology to reconnect a part of the population with doctors and improve the access of women to healthcare. And ultimately, and I will conclude there, the last point is all the efforts that we need to make to improve involvement of women in tech startups, in tech ventures, in tech companies. Because in the end, all of our efforts in health if we want them to really bear fruits for women, we need also to have women directly in the driving seat of those ventures. And that's, for example, what we are doing with the Daring Circle. We are working together on that. Uh, with the Daring Circle in order to provide mentoring, coaching, development programs for women so that they can play the leading role in our ventures or that we can help them develop their own ventures when they created some with a very strong focus around access to health. Thank you. Um, and you know, you've touched on so many things. I know others will touch on it. Education, access, and really, again, this sort of digital revolution. But I want to turn to Edna, who is such a pioneer um, and extraordinary history in talking about the fundamentals in, of um, access in your own hospital um, uh, in Somaliland. So. Thank you, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share with you the, uh, the reality on the ground. I'm in awe in all that is happening, all the developments that are happening around the world in technology, in, in, in medicine, in telemedicine. And I come from the other, end, the other side of the spectrum. I come from one of the poorest countries in the world, a country that has been totally leveled to the ground as a result of war, a country where during the 
11 years of civil war, there were no schools. Um, educated people were either executed or killed or fled the country, and the country was left pretty much to its own devices and to try and pick itself up from the ashes um, uh, to rebuild and bring the people back and do what they could with what they had. Uh, children were being taught, not in schools or classrooms because they had none, they were not being taught by teachers who were trained because we had none. They were being taught by anybody who knew something about the alphabet. Teach the children under the shade of a tree the different alphabets. The A, the B, the C, using their finger, not a laptop, not an iPad, not a, a, a carnet or crayon, the sand, your finger, as you do in the beach. And with that humble beginning, 30 years ago, Somaliland has picked itself up. And one of the biggest things that, um, after I retired from the UN 22 years ago, the biggest contribution I could make to my people was to try and first empower people themselves, and particularly empower women. Uh, women should not be left behind just because they're women. They're worth half as much as a man, but because women, are part of the community, part of the society, important members of society. And my humble contribution was to try and train as many midwives as I could. I'm a midwife, I'm a nurse. This is what I know what to do about. Today, we have over a thousand midwives and nurses who we send throughout the country, particularly to isolated places, so they can be with the women in the hill, in the valley, in the desert, with the nomads, following the goats. And wherever we have a gathering point, a small village where there's a, maybe a, a well or a small shop, that's where communities, people would congregate, would buy their resources. And there we would have somebody who knows about health, who can check on the pregnancy, who can treat minor ailments. And with that humble beginning, Today we have 31 universities in Somaliland. And only last month, 11 medical schools were evaluated. And I'm humbled and privileged and grateful that my university was ranked fourth, uh, third in Somaliland for training medical doctors. So what we invested in is human capital combined with as much technology as we could get hold of. Everybody has a smartphone. So when we give trained midwives a bag that contains basic medical supplies to help in a delivery, we also give her a mobile phone. And we start by giving her a $10 credit. And with that $10 credit, we make her understand that this is what's going to stand between life and death for a woman. And she, shouldn't, she should always have that reserve of $10. So that when she has an emergency, a woman is going through convulsions because of a pregnancy um, caused high blood pressure and eclampsia, she can call. Somebody's having a hemorrhage. Somebody's having respiratory distress in a newborn. She can call. And with that call, we can either advise what she can do or we can send an ambulance to reach her which is faster than a woman or their child could be brought to us. Knowing that wherever they are, transportation is very difficult. We don't have helicopters like you do. We don't have, we don't have uh, fast vehicles. We don't have roads. The only communications they have is that occasional truck that brings, uh, resource, uh, brings rations and drops it off in different shops. And it could take it could be once a week, a hemorrhage doesn't wait a week. Could be uh, respiratory distress, a child who needs to breathe, who needs oxygen, needs oxygen now. So with that humble basic smartphone or that telephone, it may not even be a, tele um, a smartphone, it could just be a regular telephone, that person can communicate to us whatever the emergencies are on the, on the ground and we try to respond to respond to it as best we can. Now, this, the, the, the great miracle, the great miracle is that with basic minimum training 
of midwives, you can save the lives of women. And in my country, Somaliland, in the Horn of Africa, a country that 30 years ago had one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the world, we have been able to reduce maternal mortality to a quarter of the national average simply by training health professionals and having a readiness to respond to the five or six major obstetrical emergencies that kill women and kill their babies. And if it can be done in Somaliland, it can be done everywhere. And my target was to train 1,000 midwives for my country, Somaliland, with four million population in a country that is as big as England and Wales combined. My target is for my sisters and brothers from that great continent of Africa to follow the example of Somaliland, the poorest country, the most deprived country, the country that has known the worst atrocities of war, can reduce its maternal mortality to a quarter of the national average, not because there is a, a resolution sitting in Geneva or New York that says resolution X, Y, Z, you know, supports maternal, you know, the reduction of maternal mortality, but facts on the ground, feet on the ground, hands on the ground, hearts on the ground, and the determination of the people to try and save its mothers. And my message to my sisters in, my, in countries like mine is train one million for each country, hopefully one, one million country, million midwives for the continent of Africa. That's how we will save our women. That's how we will save the mothers of our children. 1,000 per country, one million for the continent of Africa. That's the challenge I leave with you. I'm 82, I'm not gonna be around for too long, but I sure will come back and haunt you if you don't do that. So inspiring, and um, Somaliland has really given the planet a great gift in you, so thank you. Um, you know, I also want to say, um, for this conference, um, Edna and I had the pleasure of seeing one of the groups sponsored by AXA that has turned a mobile phone into a diagnostic tool for cervical cancer. Um, many of you may think cervical cancer was you know, completed by both the vaccine or the pap smear, but 300,000 women a year, 300,000 women a year die every year from cervical cancer. Those deaths should never happen. And um, the great benefit of this conference is I have no doubt that by next year, women in Somaliland will be um, being diagnosed through this cell phone um, because of this interaction. So absolutely, um, absolutely. And, and you know, rather than having a diamond tiara, I would love to save up for one of those gadgets because I come again <laughs> from a country that doesn't have the vaccine, the the, uh, the antipapilloma virus uh, vaccine for our women. It doesn't exist. We don't have mammograms. Women come with, with, with huge cauliflowers, but cancer is so advanced that there's really little we can do about it. And I was amazed and I was mesmerized by the simple technology that really can save lives. And if I save anything, it's gonna be for one of those, or two, two or three, for in different sections of, my, of, of the country. So Absolutely. thank you for reminding me about that, thanks. So mesmerized and magical are really great terms, but the ability, again, for technology to kind of bridge these gaps and take this kind of duration of time where it takes is amazing. But you know, you've also mentioned human capital. So Luna, I think we've talked about that and um, would like to hear you kind of comment. It can't just be technology. <laughs> Thank you. So imagine yourself on an island, one kilometer by one kilometer. It dis it's of silt. On a river, which is flowing at 10 knots an hour, and the breadth of the river can hold the city of Paris in between. Hundreds of these islands along the coastal belt and on the three of the biggest rivers in the, in the world, the Brahmaputra, the Ganges, and the Jamuna. 
This is, and the storm, and then when the storm starts, the island starts breaking. People lose everything. They do not even have the resources to cross over and go to the mainland or to safety because there's not even a boat. And it's not the story of a few hundred thousand people. It's a story of about 10 million on these islands, another 20 million on the coastal belt of Bangladesh country, which is going to be the most worst, one of the countries most affected by climate change. 2020, we'll see 40 million people who will be in this migratory situation in Bangladesh. So, and it's all around the world. So in that context, even technology needs to, we need to step back initially for technology. Because there is this woman, when we brought in our hospital ships, we started the first hospital ships in Bangladesh, and uh, it's supposed to be the original floating hospitals, and um, we thought that we've done it. I mean, healthcare at the doorsteps of the people. We have pathological laboratories, we, we had foreign doctors coming in doing operation, local doctors doing operation, taking care of all the people in health. Because you know, when, health, when you're suffering, all of us know, no other development intervention is even thought of or is possible. You just suffer. And that suffering had to be done before you become a statistics of death. And in that, with that hospital ship, one day I see a, a woman coming crying why? Because a child had died. So I go over to the island. Why has the child died? The child died from diarrhea. Mother did not even know salt and sugar may have saved her. Could not, did not have five euro cent to bring the child across to the hospital ships. So a child dies. We needed to revamp all our ideas all the way we were. So we started clinics, satellite clinics, moving into these areas. One day I see a child burnt crying and crying for three days. Not even a paracetamol or access to even a balm. We again reshuffled our healthcare system and we started putting in community Medicaids. So today the Friendship Healthcare System reaches about 5.68% of the population of Bangladesh, which is 160 million people. We have been working in, in, a, in a way where we call, we call it the three-tier healthcare system, the uh, hospital ships. Then we have the satellite clinics and we have the community medic aids per month about servicing about 300 to 350,000 people with about 500,000 service delivery. And in this context, we realized that just of course that health was not enough. So what do you do? You need to step back and it's all glo about global healthcare. And global healthcare is not only a health intervention. Global healthcare is when this woman falls, she has to be fixed up, that has to be exemplary, people need to see the changes happening, and then they need to trust that they can be cured and access. It needs education, because otherwise at the end of the day when you're healthy, you need food in your stomach. So we started those uh, programs of sustainable economic development. Then you need hope, you need education for children because then they want to take off. Once you're cured, you want to take off. You take off. We started education, we started then empowering women with linkages to the government because in 160 million, a country of 160 million, where still 40% of the people are below the ultra poor level. That means $1 a day for a family of six. In a context like that, you need to also ensure that you, are not, you cannot be the only supplier of any everything. You need to ensure that you have the government on board with you. So we started linking up the friendship uh, uh, communities with the government system through our inclusive citizenship. And then you step back and you see so much of it is being kind of provided when the government can do it, which they try, but it's not always successful. You need to fill the gap, and that's extremely important. So, for example, and as you're mentioning cervical cancer, in the first year, we realized people did not even want to come to, for examination because that was very invasive. Last three years, over 120,000 women have been screened, diagnosed, fixed up, you know, or, or sent to other uh, cancer centers. One, six of them died, unfortunately. But we follow up. And the follow-up is done because we do it through this three-tier healthcare system linking one to the other. We also need to be 
step back and understand that technology, technology is very important. You know, friendship uses technology at every step. We are working with the Luxembourg government for, with the SATMET, first uh, uh, VSATs in the country. We have put in um, uh, mar maritime VSATs in all our hospital ships. This year we'll have our seventh hospital ship. We've got hospitals in the coastal belt, all in remote areas, so we're linking it up with foreign doctors, local doctors. So we use technology. We have to build our own uh, app for mHealth because what we needed, just we could not just get it. It was a person, when you go to the field and you say that I've got a stomach ache, you don't even know where your stomach is. So we needed to train these community medics to be able to diagnose, deliver, link up, and also track cases of cervical cancer, children with needing immunization. So we had to put this in, and we have got now over 1.7 million diagnoses already done on our, on our M, with our M Health. And in the Rohingya camp, it was done in like, uh, we said it also in the Rohingya camps. We are the biggest, uh, se second biggest healthcare organization working there. All this, the technology needs to be put in at the right time, amount that can be received by the people, and which can work with the, you know, you, you have to ensure that when you're putting in a tool, it can match with what is happening on the ground. We just to give in one example. So we had one mm, uh, uh, equipment which came in for the field to be used by our community medic aides. The cost of that was 35,000 euro. How can we put this on the field? So we need to be very careful with what we do. And at the end of the day, how you work with the community to actually see the changes happening. We use technology, we use research, we use statistics and data, but it's all for one purpose, that the last, in the end, we can serve that com person because those are the voices that of tomorrow that we are going to have. And this is the link which we need to do, and we need to work with deep respect and dignity in the communities. We cannot come in and just provide a solution and expect that it's going to work. We really need to go deep inside and work with dignity and respect. Thank you. Thank you, Runa. So this is um, a, just a reminder about um, the complexity of health and that it is really, the definition of health does not happen in a doctor's office, it's holistic. Um, you know, even Donald Trump has tweeted that healthcare is complex. Um, and. <laughs> Um, um, and uh, but you also um, remind us that the access, um, the really the physical barriers to access, both in time and the ability to, for women to even get to um, hospitals, let alone for repeat visits, is not really feasible in so many communities, right? Um, and this is the promise, of course, of digital capabilities in telemedicine. But as I turn to Shelley and Microsoft. Uh, shocking, half the world won't even have access to that. Yeah, thank you very much. My head is like swimming from the last uh, three speakers, and I'm so inspired by all the things you all are doing and just so many great points. So I'm Shelley McKinley. I am the Vice President for Technology and Corporate Responsibility at Microsoft. On any given day, we have you know, m multiple hundreds, if not thousands, of people across the company working on all kinds of different aspects of, that are at the intersection of computer science and healthcare. We aren't a healthcare provider ourselves, uh, but we work on it every day because our goal is to help empower others that are working in these areas to be more efficient, make more efficient use of your limited resources um, because we all know the problems are too great, time is too short, uh, and resources are too limited for us to just do it alone in the old, old ways that we've done it. And I was so inspired to hear your story how just a basic cell phone um, actually makes a massive difference when you think about that mobile worker going out into the field and being able to just call someone. Um, and we do face a connectivity crisis in, on the globe today. I think it was about a few months ago where um, 
there was an announcement made then that half of the people on the planet have access to the internet. Does that surprise anyone? I was shocked to hear that actually. Um, when I think about our own situation in the US, it's, it's, you think of emerging markets of ha having access challenges, we've got a massive access challenge in the United States and across Europe in places where we say that 100% of the people are covered, but they actually aren't. Um, that's why one of the programs that we have at Microsoft works on fundamentally connecting unconnected people. Um, and that's not just because people should be connected to shop online or watch videos, and that's all legitimate uses of the internet, but there are so many basic needs that today can be assisted by having connectivity. Imagine your mobile healthcare worker has their cell phone. Imagine if every customer they served had some basic ability to connect to the internet and have ongoing monitoring past that visit from the mobile healthcare worker. And so uh, we have a program called Airband, um, and that is fundamentally what we're doing across both um, emerging and um, developed markets is ex using, working with partners to extend access. Just like we aren't a healthcare provider, we also aren't directly an internet service provider, but it's about helping uh, empower people with technology to extend uh, access to things like healthcare and many other things. Um, so it's just a real pleasure to be here on this panel with uh, everyone here working on, on these issues. Thank you. Um, I, uh, Shelley reminds me that, um, particularly in, you know, um, in the US, in rural communities, 80% of those communities um, do not have any kind of psychiatrist. 60% are um, often without OB services. Uh, and the ability for a cell phone to be able to supply, um, act and as an ultrasound, if you will, to make sure that development of, of, uh, for pregnant women is going well, for it to be able to also act as a mental health advocate and tool, um, and I'm sure we'll, there's some examples, again, um, is, you know, really liberates these individuals and really helps them. So, but it can't be done if they don't have access. You know, Maria, we're gonna turn um, one of the, uh, you know, um, I think again, along this, these conversations, one of the things that's really compelling is that on one hand, we have extraordinary technology, and yet we also have, um, you know, places where, you know, just understanding of basic anatomy, education um, is really limited for women and particularly around um, the reproductive rights. So I'd love to hear um, you talk about what RB is doing there. Thank you, Lorna. And um, thank you, the organizers, for giving me the opportunity to be here today and uh, represent uh, my company. RB, um, I feel uh, really proud. I am going to start presenting myself. I am a woman. I am a mom of two quasi adults. I say quasi because they have the age, but not yet uh, there. <laughs> I, I am a daughter as well, and uh, I am changing roles with parents now. Who cares who? It's uh, the question now. I am a wife and I am a patient professional. I am a pharmacist by education and all my career has been in healthcare. So it's something that basically fills in all. I deliver healthcare for uh, people. And um, in my role, I am a global regulatory uh, head uh, strategy and innovation. I deliver innovation, and innovation is not only products, but also solutions to help people. I ensure that I deliver with the right quality, efficacy, and safety, and uh, meeting the regulations and the requirements. I, f I, I am privileged of uh, working in RB, a company that has a clear purpose and wants to make a difference in healthcare. And this purpose is we believe in a world where people have uh, better lives and healthier as well. We are conscious of the problems of healthcare. Uh, access to healthcare is not everywhere. We are hearing that. We know also that there is not enough healthcare professionals everywhere. And uh, we know also the systems in developed markets and developing markets are overburdened. So conscious of that, and also conscious that women 
as uh, Guillaume said, play a key role in healthcare. And uh, basically are the ones that in 80% of the cases are taking decisions on health in the family. And I am one of those. So I am with the thermometer in the hands as soon as someone in the family is uh, feeling not well, and especially if it's my children. So RB, as well as uh, all healthcare companies, we have a huge responsibility in giving access to these um, healthcare products more broadly. And uh, it's not only products, as said, it's solutions as well. And we have the responsibility of educating for the perfect use of those products. And this is what we are doing. A lot of focus in promoting responsible healthcare, self-care and self-medication to allow people and to help people to make their own decisions on their own health, as well as we are promoting educational campaigns in different parts of the world with several examples around prevention of HIV in Africa. For example, uh, to reduce the incidents where basically young girls are infected, uh, I think it's 6,000 a, uh, a week, which is massive. So with Durex, we are, with, which is one of our brands, we are running a campaign that is reaching now 1 billion people and uh, also uh, supporting programs like uh, keeping girls in schools to ensure they are educated to prevent HIV and uh, pregnancy, um, what is needed. Uh, we also uh, run uh, education campaigns to raise awareness on hygiene that at the end of the day has an important out outcome on health. And uh, especially in India, we partner with the government in India, a different charity organizations to basically uh, run a campaign to basically improve sanitization and health um, hygiene measures in, in this country. And I am proud to say that now hand washing is in the curriculum in, in schools in the many Indian states. The campaign is uh, expanding to cover um, not only uh, hygiene, uh, but also and sanitization, but also um, uh, nutrition and breastfeeding. So we are expecting also to help the population in India um, and uh, drive good health outcomes out of them. With regards to technology, uh, the role of uh, Arby as uh, other healthcare company, we are very focused in three areas. Uh, basically, we are moving from products to products plus solutions. And these solutions are digital uh, apps, uh, digital um, uh, tools that allow self-diagnose, allow also a compliance of the treatments, so devices that allows to fully comply with the treatments um, uh, to people, and also allows this uh, connection with healthcare professionals through technology, like telemedicine and uh, teleassistance, because we work in the, in the work of also having other healthcare professionals connected. The second thing in technology that is very important is linked with education. Uh, the investment in digital is massive uh, in RB as well as uh, other healthcare companies doing the same. Websites with uh, health information, this is key. It's not only explaining around certain problems uh, uh, that we are facing around healthcare, but also explaining the correct use of the products. And our responsibility is to make sure this information is accurate is, is, uh, is correct. And the other area is uh, linked with physical proximity of uh, healthcare. And we are bringing the products into the homes of more people by e-pharmacy and e-commerce. So this is what we do at RB. Fantastic. And <laughs> worthy. 
um, we commented on um, self-care uh, and I think and self-diagnosis and before you all get worried you don't have to become doctors um, the really what the technology is allowing is particularly through artificial intelligence an ability to use algorithms um, and data and science to allow individuals to feel confident in making decisions that they otherwise would have had to, again, travel to a physician or maybe even talk on a phone for now th for them to be able to have that freedom. And when we talk about 80% um, uh, you know, women being 80% of the consumers, there are certainly business opportunities. But for those of us who do manage the health care of our families, we can also comment that, quite frankly, it's exhausting. <laughs> so um, it also the ability to um, you know, really to make it more efficient. So I know Microsoft is a leader in artificial intelligence, Shelley. Um, can you just talk a little bit about how you see that playing out in healthcare or in broader opportunities for women? Sure. Um, I, you know, artificial intelligence is sort of one end of the spectrum of advanced technology. Um, I think you've, you've heard about all kinds of different levels of technology that's going to help people. And AI is fundamentally the future and will be in absolutely everything we do. Um, so what we're, what we're doing, what we're seeing now is in things like one of the programs I work on is called AI for Accessibility, uh, which has, is related to healthcare, not always, but in, in many ways, um, that helps people with disabilities, whether that's people that can't see very well, can't hear very well, aren't very mobile. Um, and how do we use um, AI to you know, take data, um, use big compute, which requires cloud and cloud connectivity at some point in the chain, um, and, and derive insights to be able to take action out of that exactly as you were talking about, to help people understand how they can help manage their own care. But it doesn't replace doctors, it doesn't replace healthcare workers, it augments capabilities. And I think that's one of the most important things to understand about AI, um, is that it doesn't obviate the need for healthcare providers and people who have uh, healthcare training and education. It really is about taking away some of the things that maybe we can't see or detect today because of the volumes of data we have to go through in order to, to see those detections. Um, so it really is a way to um, make better use of limited resources that we have in our human uh, capacities. Fantastic, and it's um, and again to your point, when we look at one of the areas um, where it's very meaningful for women and men, which is mental health, the current structure we will just never have enough psychiatrists to meet the demand. So this ability to augment um, uh, services and again help individuals. So as I think you've gotten a taste that you know healthcare, how healthcare is delivered, how it's financed is really undergoing an extraordinary revolution. And when we look to Rock Health, who uh, is an incubator in uh, San Francisco, they track investment in health. $36 billion of venture capital funds from 2011 till now have gone into health tech, but only 8% of it has gone to women. So I'm turning to you, Guillaume, um, as someone involved in the financing of, of health care. How do we correct this? How do we get women entrepreneurs at the table, at the helm, and how do we get them financed? Thank you very much. Yes, that's, that's a very big challenge that we have, not just in health, in general in the tech world, as we all know. Uh, so that's why we uh, have teamed up with a number of companies in this daring circle initiative. And, and broadly speaking, I think that we need to acknowledge that there are two big topics to tackle. The first one is that where we need to put women first and foremost is directly in the venture capitalist funds. In many of the cases, those funds are run by men, it's a fact, and many of the partners then ultimately are men, and so by definition it is creating some bias. Even myself, when I make investment decisions on behalf of AXA, I have bias. It's like something that is unavoidable. So how, concretely speaking, can I change that by making sure that when I make those decisions, I have women around me and we discuss the various topics collectively and then we make a move. Uh, and for example, uh, a bit more than a year ago, to help us on assessing the medical quality 
of all the businesses we would like to invest in, we hired uh, uh, an amazing woman uh, named Shadon Marzouk, who is based in Asia and is helping us uh, really assessing all of those files. So that's the first point. You need to hire women in all the VCs, the investment committees, everywhere to help you make the, be the best decisions possible. And then the second point is uh, uh, making a step towards funding more ventures that are directly led by women, because this is where the difference will come from. And there, I'm afraid that there is no other option than to put in place some quota, one way or another, because otherwise we will never move. And uh, I know that in many cases, we are challenging uh, whether it's really necessary, what can be the sort of negative impact of quotas. Yes, quotas can create some difficulties also, but it's also a fact that in so many cases, progress has been achieved only through quotas. I will just make one example that we know well in this country, but I do believe that without the quotas, we would have never reached 50% of women in the boardrooms of listed companies. That's when change has starting making, uh, are starting happening. So this question needs to be tackled and collectively we need to make a stance in this direction. Thank you. Um, so uh, we had this conversation and I think it's gone through and I just um, again uh, applaud both the comment and um, amplify that quotas work. Um, so I am here because of a quota because Title VII. So, um, so uh, thank you for that comment um, and I concur. We only have a few more minutes, but we would be remiss if we didn't each take a little moment to, um, to really, you know, articulate a call to action for this audience. So Maria, I'll start with you. Okay, um, our call for action is basically as a big company, uh, we want to make a difference in, in health. So we want to continue having this partnership with different uh, organizations and governments and uh, institutions to continue the educational campaigns in these parts of the world that need. And uh, it's not only in developing markets, it's also basically in other, in other countries develop as well because the needs maybe are different, but uh, there is a need of education in healthcare anyway. So what our call for action is really to partner with these institutions and uh, the uh, institutions and governments facilitate this partnership. And the second one is we are going to continue promoting the um, responsible self-care. Uh, we know this is uh, helping people and we know this is helping uh, healthcare systems. So the call is for governments to basically look at healthcare, self-medication, and self-care as a mean uh, to basically maintain the sustainability of the system and Great. benefit people. Thank, Thank you. you. Shelley. Yes, a very, um, very concrete and simple call to action. If you're working in the area of healthcare, particularly in telehealth, in low connectivity areas, um, please reach out. We would, we're always looking for more partners um, to help in that area, we're a convener, um, and we bring together multiple government, private interests um, to roll out um, connectivity and ultimately solutions on the connectivity around telehealth would be fantastic. So please feel free to reach out. Great, Yuna. Thank you. I uh, we need you to help us fill gaps, fill the gaps of understanding that with the technology that you've got in the world today. Organizations which are doing this technology is having the fundings. How do we actually make the impact at the field level? Because the path is so winding. There are so many interests. There are so many different agendas that we can hardly climb up through to actually have that impact in the field. So help us if you know ways and directions by which we can make some jumps and fill these gaps. Thank you. So Guillaume, I hope you don't mind, um, but uh, we are at, uh, out of time, so I think it's only appropriate that we give Edna the last word. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, I call out for help. For help me. I'm trying to train school teachers, and the only way I can reach people and give them education eventually is by giving them a basic education, starting from the bottom. I cannot access, I cannot find people to come and help me teach. 
um, trainers who eventually become school teachers. Help us train our doctors. Family medicine is the way to go in my country. We don't have the luxury of specialties, but family medicine people reach the unreachable. And I welcome the offer from Microsoft. I welcome it because Somaliland can be an incubator where we can do a lot of learning um, of what to do for countries with low resources like mine. Great. And uh, thank you for this opportunity. And I have my, my life book out there. My memoir is out at the door. And I'll tell you what I've been do up to for the last 82 years of my life. A bit of mischief, a bit of trouble, and a bit of a few good things. So thank you for this opportunity. Great, great. And thank you. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you to this panel. Great.